as part of other projects would unwittingly uncover what the employee experience actually was like within the organization. And unfortunately, most often it wasn't good. That 26% of people that don't feel emotionally safe, I'm surprised that it's that low. When I saw that number, I would have expected it to be significantly higher. There was a disconnect between what leaders believed was happening in the organization and what was actually happening on the front lines with supervisors, even with managers. The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability explicit or implied shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on in the world of business, technology, and HR. Here's your host, Ira Wolf. Welcome back, Googleization Nation. Welcome back, Jason. So Good to another, see you, my friend. Yeah, another How are your travels? Of, another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization. Here we are. The travels were exhausting for those who, who remember last week. Uh, I was a little under the weather, had a head cold and whatever else was going on, and then drove down to the airport. Uh, you know, one, one of the things I miss about being quarantined is we didn't have to make all those trips. Drove down to the airport. We, we actually fly out of Baltimore, which is almost a three-hour drive. Uh, and then you're in the airport and then you're on the plane with the mask, all, all under mask, except for the drive down. Then when we got there and it was about, actually it was pretty seamless. Travel was uneventful other than as I said, being in a, in a, in a tube going a couple hundred miles an hour with the mask on. And we, then we had to find a place for dinner because when we got to the airport, it was, they were already starting to board. So it was just a, a long, exhausting day. And I had a good visit with, with uh, my mother who is 98. And the tires us out incredible all the time. So yeah, it's it's yeah, it's pretty incredible. So we had a good good time that. But it, what you know, we talk about you know when the shift hits your plan, and and there's just a lot of crazy shift going on. We got to be careful when you say that. But there's a lot of crazy shift <laughs> going on. We got another great show today. We have Gil Coat is going to join us in just a few minutes. We're going to be talking about employee experience, and again, it's a mess. I mean, I love uh, you know our wrote the description and you talked about R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect, 50, uh, 54 years ago. It was, the wow. number, it was the number one song in America and topping the billboards. And, and yet it seems that it's disappeared, whether it's in at work, whether it's you know, in, in politics, in our community, even within our families. You know, respect seems to have gone out the window, but we're going to talk about ways that that people like Gil are are trying to help companies understand. And there are companies that that do respect employees and they do respect candidates and they're doing the right thing. But it gets lost in in a lot of the noise that's out there. Yesterday, just Roxy, if you can pull up that slide that I sent you, because I think that the images are so striking uh, and this will be right up your alley as well, Jason. This was new data that just was released from SHRM. I attended a, a participated in a, in a me- webinar yesterday, and these numbers were just released. 59% of workers are, are, are leaving work feeling exhausted. 30%, a third, dread going to work. 26% do not feel emotionally safe at work. One, one out of every four. And 30% say their workplace culture makes them irritable at home, which out of the other ones here, that's probably the minor one <laughs> that, that if you're only feeling irritable, it's, it's just striking. It's frightening. It's, it's distressing. It's disappointing that those are the numbers. And then you have to wonder how many I shared that last night in my organizational leadership class, change class that we were doing. And one of the workers, one of the students works in healthcare. And she said, I think those numbers are low. We said, what do, what do you wow. think about that? And she goes, I think they're really, really low. I believe it. I believe it. And, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we're in this 
period right now where a lot of leaders think, well, the magic pill for a lot of this is we're going to let people work from home. And mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, that is a great option for a lot of people. But the, the evidence that's coming out in terms of how working from home is going for a lot of people now, it's a little bit distressing. A lot of people feel invisible working from home, not in a good way, but in a bad way in terms of feeling disconnected. They're spending less time with their managers and supervisors, on average about six hours per week. And then they're also working more. And so you constantly are bombarded while you're working from home many times with wearing different hats and roles. You're getting calls to go pick up your kid from school, drop them off to different things. You're trying to help them with their homework. You may be taking care of an, an elderly parent. It's like all of a sudden, a lot of these, these different hats where we used to kind of segment a little bit more, everything's fully integrated. And I think we can get there to where it works much better for a lot of people, but it's going to take some very clear policies from companies to support many workers in being successful working from home so that they don't feel drained. Many of those stats that you just shared that they don't feel like all of a sudden they feel hopeless or that their, their life work integration is completely out of whack. Mm -hmm. We've got to get back on track. And I'm excited that we have Gil today because just as you mentioned, I think he has a lot of expertise and employee experience. And I think that can help be the blueprint for how we can equip leaders with the things that are needed to get things back on track, including for remote working employees too. Absolutely. So there's there's a whole lot we need to talk about. And what I'd like to do is why don't we just bring Gil on uh, since he is an expert, kind of well-versed, entrenched in this. It, like me, you know, you, you live it and die it every day. So, <laughs> so welcome, welcome to Geek Skeezers and Googleization, Gil. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for the great intro. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. So things are, you know, as, as you heard Jason say, you know, there's there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done. The employee experience was not necessarily very good before. If you if you follow Gallup, okay. they, you know, for for what twenty years is it that they or maybe longer? It's either twenty or thirty years they've been studying employee engagement, and you know, at its peak, it was seventy. Seventy or thirty percent were engaged, and seventy percent were disengaged. Uh, and then you throw a pandemic into it, and then you throw in hybrid workplaces. Uh, people are struggling because they have to go to work. People are struggling because they have to stay home, and people are struggling when they get to work because companies and employers and leaders, managers are still trying to figure it all out. So, why don't we start with tell us a little bit? You you kind of invested and say, hey, I'm going to focus on employee experience. You created, you started a company about. Two years ago? January 2020, yes. Yeah, perfect timing. for, for <laughs> <laughs> Two months before the pandemic hit, let me tell you, that is absolutely <laughs> tongue-in-cheek the best timing you can think of. Because, uh, it, I, I, uh, I it was not what I expected, and all of my plans went uh, went out the window uh, mid middle of March. Yeah. But I'll say, so for me, employee experience is my passion. It's what I care about. A lot of it goes back to two main things. One, it goes back to the first 16 years of my career. I was a consultant focused around organizational development, talent management, helped write a lot of competency profiles, articulate values and vision. In doing that, I spent a lot of time in focus groups with frontline employees who were empowered to say things that they didn't feel comfortable telling their managers or telling HR. And so what would happen is we, as part of other projects, would unwittingly uncover what the employee experience actually was like within the organization. And unfortunately, most often it wasn't good. That 26% of people that don't feel emotionally safe, I'm surprised that it's that low. When I saw that number, I would have expected it to be significantly higher. But if we're going to trust that number, then I'm happy about it because uh, it's it's better than I expected. So, But that was one thing that really drove me was seeing there was a disconnect between what leaders believed was happening in the organization and what was actually happening on the front lines with supervisors, even with managers, because of the, you're familiar with the iceberg of ignorance, and so be, because of the causes of the iceberg of ignorance, because of the power dynamic, because of a lack of psychological safety, a lot of issues weren't known to leadership, in particular around employee experience issues. Mm 
because even now there are a lot of companies that think collecting voice of employee is doing a yearly survey, which obviously is only going to do so much. But then, so that was one part of it and that built in me over a long time. But then there was another part of it where I was watching a speech from an individual, a UX designer, user experience designer here in Toronto. And back when we could be in person, he was speaking in person and he was talking about how everything in life is user experience. Everything we do in life is user experience. And the example he used was the chairs people were sitting on about, you know, how comfortable are they? Do they encourage you being alert and listening to the speaker? How do they feel on the knees when you're standing up and sitting down? All of these things, which then kind of dawned on me. Okay, so what's the biggest experience any of us have, most profoundly impactful experience any of us have is with our company. And at the time, I had already started learning because there were a lot of people, brilliant people who had started around employee experience, which was, for the most part at that time, just taking customer experience ideals and applying them internally. But integrating the employee lens in not just what people want, but what they actually psychologically need aligning leadership decisions, not just with, well, we want to achieve 5% lower costs, we want to achieve 5% better retention or whatever it is, but how do you actually lead people down that path in a way where they're productive? And I will say from my perspective, I slightly disagree with you on that point where you're saying the irritability issue was lesser than the other ones, because that irritability if you're irritable with people at home, that means there's stress, there's tension, and you're thinking about these issues at times where you shouldn't be. Like Jason said, it's harder to disconnect, especially when you know we're working and living in the same place. And so that irritability represents the impact of the employee experience, a very under-discussed mm -hmm. impact of the employee experience, because how are you sleeping at night? Are you able to go exercise? Are you eating healthily? All of these things are impacted by your employee experience, by the fact that you leave at the end of the day exhausted or delighted. I often say the informal measure, and I think I've told Jason this one before, but I often say the informal measure of employee experience within an organization is what percent of people are feeling the Sunday scaries on Sunday? What percentage of people are dreading going to work versus I was actually talking to a person the other day who they have in their role, the Monday morning happies that they are so excited to go to work because it drives them. It motivates them. It, it serves their wellness in so many ways and it's a disheartening thing because the sunday scaries are ubiquitous i mean i don't think i've met a person who's 30 plus who hasn't had a job and probably most even 25 plus who hasn't had a job who caused that in fact when i have conversations with people in their 40s 50s 60s some of them say wait that isn't everywhere that they've had that every sunday of their working career and so that's why employee experience for me is such a passion. And that's also why there is now the world is slowly catching up to the possibilities of employee experience. And one of the things that when you asked me, when I'm grateful you invited me to be on the show, you asked me, what do you want to talk about? One of the broad societal issues that I find really fascinating right now is the changes in demand conditions for work. And so I don't know if the audience, uh, if, I don't know if they still teach Michael Porter at all in, in business school or anything. So for those unfamiliar, demand conditions are the size and nature of the demand for a product or service. But in this case, I'm talking about the size and nature of the demand for employment, which has been dramatically changing Certainly over my career, I joined uh, the business world right as the dot-com bubble burst, which was a wonderful time to graduate business school. Again, <laughs> very tongue-in-cheek. 
but I've noticed significant changes around the demand conditions. You know, we talk about the size of the demand conditions. I think you even discussed this a couple of weeks ago when you had Jacob Morgan on talking about the demographic shifts that as baby boomers retire, there aren't as many people, at least here in North America, to fill their shoes. There are fewer of us Gen Xers, Millennials, and Gen Z to fill their shoes. I mean, I remember seeing a chart about this 20 years ago in business school of the increase of demand of jobs and then the curve going like that at a certain point as all the baby boomers leave. So now we have more roles growing, especially in an economy that's growing, and not as many people to fill them barring immigration or remote work, which is a whole other topic. So starting with that size, there are fewer people to, to choose from. So now going from our economics 101, well, as uh, supply goes down, the cost goes up and that's not necessarily just monetarily. Those who are, who are more in demand now get to make more of the choices. A lot of people make, I don't like the term, the great resignation. I'm not a fan of the term in particular because it comes completely from the organizational lens and not from the human lens. It's saying that this big societal shift, let's look at it from how it's impacting companies, whereas I look at it more as how is it, it's impacting people. But one of the important things about it that people need to understand is this isn't just because of COVID. This didn't just happen because of COVID. This reprioritization has been happening for years. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the indicator. It's called the take this job and shove it indicator in the US, <laughs> which is the percent of total separations from employment as quits versus other total separations. Yeah, it jolt. came out a couple of uh, months ago. It had gotten up to 70% of the separations in the US were because the employee was quitting. And a lot of people attribute that to COVID, but if you look at the actual chart, the chart has been steadily climbing since at least the early uh, teens. It was around 2010, 2011, it was in the mid to low 40s. When COVID hit, it was already in the mid 60s. Mm -hmm. So we have this shift in demand for I'm not going to put up with bad work, not going to accept your garbage work. And a lot of people like to rag on millennials and Gen Z, but I give them a lot of credit for driving these shifts. Because when I, a Gen Xer, came into the business world, me or any of my peers, if we joined a bad company, we knew we had to be there for a couple of years. Otherwise, you're a job hopper, making it hard to find a job. Millennials and Gen Z said, no, if you give me a bad job, if you don't fulfill my experience, I could be leaving before you finish orientation. I could be looking for jobs on day one. And I've heard of a variety of stories. That's not the broad group, but it is an increase in trend which then takes us back to employee experience. So if the demand for employment is now more sophisticated and in greater power, the onus then becomes on companies where if they want the best people, they need to meet employees where they are. Meet them in understanding that this is what our employee market is demanding. And I'm often asked about, you know, how do we start with our, our journey on employee experience? The first thing is listening. It all starts with listening, understanding what are your employees' experience? How does it motivate them? How does it demotivate them? How do you attract people like that? What are you looking for from them? What are they looking for from you in creating an alignment around those expectations? Because expectations is a fundamental to great employee experiences. Every experience is filtered through expectations. That's why you can have two people in the exact same role and one is miserable and the other one's delighted. 
because what their expectations are, and not just conscious expectations, but also some things that people aren't aware of, how much they want to grow, how much autonomy they have, all of these things. But it starts with listening to them. What does my employee cohort care about? How can I drive that in a way that they get to be happy and productive at the end of the day? That those four numbers would look very differently because, I mean, emotional and psychological safety is becoming, at least it should be, just table stakes, right? That should be the bare minimum for being a manager, for being a leader, is creating psychological safety for your team. Clearly, we've got a ways to go. You know, that is such good stuff there. Just want to get, get in on a couple of those. I was at a presentation last week where they said, the speaker said, we are now in an era where the competition for talent is greater than the competition for customers. And that really took me back for a second. You know, think about that, but it's really true. And that ties into what you just shared. And the other thing too is you shared something, gosh, it was probably six or 12 months ago on LinkedIn that I thought was brilliant. And you were talking about why employee engagement has failed. And you summed it up brilliantly. And you said the problem with employee engagement is it's through the lenses of the organization. And that's why employee experience works is because it's through the lenses of the to fix things and get it right. Well, it's the meeting of the two lenses. That's the that's a really important thing I want to emphasize about employee experience is that alignment between the employee lens psychologically get it right for them, what they need, what they want. But also there is always that business lens, business lens of at the end of the day, it's best for everybody when people are productive. But that's a really interesting uh, statement. I really find that uh, fascinating. And your your point about uh, engagement and remember the post very specifically, and there were certainly some people who found it more controversial than others. But the issue I find with engagement is that it doesn't capture wellness. It doesn't capture the fact that in 2020, I spoke to numerous leaders and numerous employees who went through 2020 extremely highly engaged, no more productive, and came out of it completely burnt out. Because at a certain point, there are times where engagement needs to be balanced with other things. And it doesn't come by redefining engagement, by throwing things in there, but by intentionally saying, yes, engagement is good for the company because People are more productive, discretionary effort, they stick around longer. Now, what are the things that are good for employees? Engagement is good for employees, no question. But there are other things that also needs to be balanced with, you know, I could be highly engaged, which means I'm now, especially, you know, the data we've seen through the pandemic, I'm working remote, I'm now working an extra hour, hour and a half a day. So yeah, that's great that I'm engaged, but my blood pressure up, I'm sleeping less, and I am irritable with my family members. <laughs> so if you go back, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, and, and you may appreciate this statistic, Gil, about two weeks ago, I was called, there was a report that was released or a story that was released, I was recalled by the media. If I wanted to comment on it, why did I think it happened? And the Denver airport held the job fair, our career fair. And there's many reasons it was just a bad design, but just the numbers were were incredible. They anticipated, they planned for 5,000 people to show up. They had 1,000 jobs to offer. 100 people showed up and five people applied. (laughs) I mean, if you want to take that and I share that and I was at a conference board meeting two weeks ago, I spoke in New York at a talent acquisition council and I shared that story and people were topping it. And they go, oh, let me tell you about another one. Oh, another one. Another. So it's a, it's a real problem. I mean, it's a real, real problem of what's going on there. And, you know, I've been talking about it for 20, almost 22 years now, you know, beginning with my perfect labor storm. And you're right. Not only have the quit rates, if anybody followed that trend, said at some point we're going to reach a tipping point and it's going to break. The system's going to break. But we talked about male participation in the workforce. You know, male participation in 1948 
82% of all males, of working age males, had a job. Before the pandemic, it was 62%. And so if you watch that trend of the number of men that were active of working age that were actively working, it's been declining for all those years. And just because we had, it was camouflaged by women coming into the workforce, camouflaged by immigration, but there was an ample supply. And I think that's reached that tipping point where if there's enough of supply, if you're not happy, we'll find somebody else. If you want more money and I can find somebody cheaper, we're going to pay it. We're, we're going to go that direction. And we've reached this tipping point where there, there's almost no immigration. And I'm not sure how quickly or whenever, if ever, that will come back. I'm not sure how to reverse. I don't have a solution to how to reverse the male decline. We've probably maxed out on women unless we really change the infrastructure because they are still the primary caregivers and elder givers and, and teachers and nurses and everything else. So we've reached this crux where there, there is no immediate solution, as I always say, is there is nobody, there are no people farms with people trees that you can send out all these machine and shake them and they fall out. That's what they think staffing firms have and recruiters. Oh, you've got this pool of people back here. No, that doesn't exist because the staffing firms are, you know, talk to them all the time and staffing struggling just like everybody else. Proof yeah. it's one of the hottest roles right now. The I the numbers that I've seen in terms of the increase in pay just from Q1 till now for recruiter roles is oh, crazy astonishing, right? Developers, recruiters, salespeople, all of these roles are so necessary and so in demand for everybody, which makes it that much more than how are you going to differentiate? How are you going to differentiate yourself? Pay only goes so far, especially to keeping people around. And well, and if there's no supply, I mean, they can't create them. They be maybe better miners. They may, may be better at making relationships, but there is, there's no there's no mine that they can uncover and all these people or a tree that they can go shake. And, and that's the assumption. And everybody's going after the same one. And then you get the divisions of, you know, that if you're, you're in Toronto, you can recruit somebody in Pennsylvania as easily as I can. It, and, and there is that nature of, of how companies are, are responding. As um, a Canadian, sorry to interrupt there, but as a Canadian, I actually find that very concerning right now because I have seen a lot of that. I have seen a lot of companies who are, when they can, going back to the office in Toronto and having people from American companies poach them because even at the same dollar amount, there's a 20, 25% exchange rate difference and most companies are paying at a higher rate. So I've heard of numerous companies in Toronto and in across Canada losing employees $50,000 salary increases to a remote company in the US, there's nothing they can do about that kind of pay difference. They're just, it's, it's a really major problem. And at this point, I'm concerned about a brain drain here from Canada to the US or international companies where people will still live in Canada, but they will be working for companies that are nowhere near here. That almost makes me think of an analogy. We probably have all heard of the story about you know camping and a bear comes on the campground. You don't have to outrun the bear. You just need to outrun everybody else, right? right? <laughs> it almost makes me think we're now in this era where employer branding, like if you want to be an employer of choice, that's going to be your best strategy to try and come out of this, you know, to make you, if you haven't already established your brand, you got to start working on it to become that employer of choice where people are referring their friends and family, people that they know, you got to come work here. Even though I moved on from this location and I'm working somewhere else, I had a great experience there. You need to go back there and work. And now that there is this global competition for the talent, I've got to imagine that that is becoming extremely important. And so with that in mind, Gil, employee experience, how does it feed into helping companies become that destination employer. You said the first step is to is to listen. Is there a structured thing that they should do regarding listening with their employees to get started? And well, Gil, I'm going to ask you to hold that just a second. We're going to come back and we're going to answer. We're going to go to step two. 
right now is I want to remind everybody you're listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We are going to take a, a real quick break. We want to thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. You've been listening to Gil Cohn from Employee Experience Design. And when we come back, we're going to find out what's the second step that you need to take after you listen to your employees. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Change doesn't pick favorites. No matter who you are or where you live, the year 2020 was filled with one unexpected challenge after another. According to the authors of The Adaptation Advantage, we are incredibly well prepared for the past, but woefully unprepared for the future. That leaves millions of people feeling scared, worried, frustrated, and confused. Whether you're the owner of a business or a worker out of a job, adaptability is now an essential skill you need to ride the next wave of normal. The good news is, is that science shows that adaptability is learnable. Adaptability gives us the confidence and courage to think about change and embrace opportunity in the right way. Adaptability gives us hope for a better future. And goodness knows we need hope. Are you ready to embrace change and double down on your future? Contact Success Performance Solutions today to schedule a consultation about how you can reimagine your team's future, how you can begin to think about opportunity the right way. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We've been talking with Gil Cohn about the employee experience. Before we jump in and find out what step two is after listening, a reminder that on November 30th, I've got an adaptability webinar coming up. We're going to be talking about reimagining your tomorrow. It fits well into this conversation. Uh, Obvious companies are going to have to reimagine their companies. They're going to have to reimagine what their organization looks like, not tomorrow, but today. And we'll be talking about some tools and techniques to be able to do that. Roxy, I don't know if you have the banner there. I think it was rebrandly. Dot, yep, there it is. Rebrand.ly app to adapt 113021. Or you can go up to Success Performance Solutions website. And if it's not up there, it will be right at the top of the screen. You'll be able to click on the registration there. It is free. Uh, don't remember. I can't remember the time offhand, but. You'll, you'll be able to register and hope to see you there. But right now, let's go back to, to Gil. Gil, sorry to interrupt you there in the middle of Jason's great question. But let's talk about after you, you know, what, what do Nick companies need to do after you listen, after, after they start to listen to their employees? Where so there's a few different things. But the first thing you need to do is do something about it. That is... A major issue that what happens with companies is they will do surveys, they will they will try to collect voice of employee, and either will try to bite off more than they can chew, or be so overwhelmed that they're not they're going to have a harder time um, achieving it. Finding those areas of leverage, finding those areas that if, if you were to chart them on those things the company can do without major resource and effort that also is high on the chart of employees actually care about it. Because one of the problems that a lot of times when I speak to leaders, they think these things cost a lot of money. It's not always about money. Hmm. It's about how you treat people, how, how you present the work, the clarity they have, the expectation management that they have. And so, it's always very important that if you're going to listen, set expectations that you're not going to be able to do everything uh, that you hear, but the intent is to do something that matters. At the same time, it's important to understand that listening isn't a one and done thing. That's one of the problems historically is companies think a yearly survey we're done. Or even now there are some apps, not some apps are wonderful. Not all apps are uh, created equal, but there are some apps that they'll give you listening. They'll give you understanding, but there's still, it needs to be continuous. It needs to change because if you had decided, you know, you had a big project in 2019 to improve, improve the employee experience in December, nine, 2019, you finally finished that project and you thought, well, I'm done now. We've we've made the perfect employee experience. You'd have a a major reckoning to face in a couple of months, as most other companies that were completely unintentional about it did. So it not only needs to be this first item, 
the first time starts the evolution. It starts the ball rolling. As you saw with those numbers and a lot of numbers I see in terms of trust of leadership and trust of HR is that when starting employee experience endeavors in companies that it wasn't there already, you're going to face skepticism. And that's why it can't be a revolution of, hey, look, we're going to employ, employ this whole tech stack and we're going to change everything because you're going to blow managers' minds. As I mentioned, one end of the evolution of collecting voice of employee is a survey or nothing at all. At the other end would be continuous listening through managers who are able to have these conversations, who create psychological safety that you don't have to wait until a survey or until an app asks you how you're doing because I, the manager already knows how you're doing why you're doing that way and what they can do about the experience in the environment to help serve you to create, be more productive, be less stressed and be overall better at the end of the day. So do something about it. That's step two. Get off mute here. Are there, you know, I always learn from examples. Um, and so working with some companies, have you, can you without breaking confidentiality because, I'm, because we don't want you to do that but is there an example of, of an organization that you were working with that took some steps and you know what they did and what type of improvement they had absolutely so there was a company i was working with a little while back where their issue was that they were having significant turnover within the first three to six months that was at least how it was presenting to them. But yeah. then upon- Pretty common. <laughs> Pretty it, common. It, is, it is extremely common. But upon diving deeper, I discovered there were two major issues. One was around realistic job previews and painting a little bit of sunshine about the role before people entering. So that's a major problem because expectations, like I said, all experiences are set through expectation. I'm personally going through a job search right now, and I always appreciate it when the person on the other end talks about the warts and all, because that lets me know, okay, these are the challenges I'm going to face. So that was one issue in the candidate experience that they were facing. But the bigger issue was that onboarding was all but non-existent completely transactional and all from the organizational lens. We need to hand you this pass. We need to get you involved in this. We need to have you sign up for this program, whatever it might be. And so I worked with them to co-create a new onboarding experience. It's, while I've seen it and I know, I also know that every organization is different and every group needs a different type of onboarding and even there's nuance within departments or within areas within an organization but that helped them stop the bleeding because instead of people leaving after three to six months because this isn't the place we thought it was or i don't feel connection to it people felt connection to it quickly which then also gets them productive more quickly which is you know organizational lens that's what they're looking for they're looking for you to get up to productivity as quickly as possible. But as an individual, you know, there is a part of many people's brains when you come into a new role of, oh, I want to get up to productivity, certainly. But there is also parts of your brain's conscious or otherwise that are thinking, I want to be accepted. I want people's behaviors to be expected and consistent around here in alignment with my values. I want a manager who's going to listen to me. I want peers who are going to trust me and not compete with me. Whatever it, uh, it might be, they need that kind of settling to fully get to that productivity that the company and the individual are looking for. You know, as you were talking, and I keep this theme keeps going through my mind, especially with the user experience, and and I focused so much on the candidate experience. My acronym that I talked about in my book was REACH, for for hiring for recruitment, and it was about first you have to reach them, then you have to engage them, then what does the application process looks like, then there's communication, but the H was hiring, and I constantly say, is that hiring does not stop at the job offer, you know, hiring 
And it doesn't stop just on once all that transactional paperwork is done and they show up on their first day. Onboarding may, depending on the company or the role, may continue for a week, a month, maybe a year. Um, you know, what type of feedback, what type of nurturing, what type of contact, you know, how's, how's that new hire doing? And that's missing, you know, in most companies. So I really appreciate where you're headed there. But the other thing that we talk about, especially in the candidate experience, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, talent board. Is that an organization? I'd look it up. I think you'll find a lot of parallels there. It's the talentboard.org. We've had Kevin Grossman on several times, a good buddy of mine, and they survey three, uh, close to 300,000 candidates a year. They work with, they have an award for the best candidate experience. So best place before you get to work kind of a thing. And what they look at is, is what we, I call them, this, this is our term, but we look at the, the acronym frustrating, confusing, disappointing, and distracting, you know, or effed up <laughs> for, for sure. <laughs> But, but it, it crosses that, and that came from somebody in UX, understanding how do we remove the friction? How do you remove what frustrates an employee? What confuses an employee? What distracts and what disappoints an employee? And if you can work on those steps, those four, those four I guess, milestones or, or the, that framework, your experience, you know, both candidate and employee experience will improve. So just a, a kind of another angle. But I, as you were talking, I kept thinking about it and then got distracted. We have just kind of a few more minutes here. I know the talent board recognizes, you know, what the most, from a candidate's perspective, what the, the top frustrating things are, you know, what what really aggravates them. And they talk about resentment. What, what turns... A, a candidate from unhappy or disappointed into resentful, which is not where you want to go. And from the employee side, is there a, like a, a top two, top three list of things that you found as a theme that just frustrate the crap out of employees? I would say number one is broken expectations. And I would say that is number one by a fair number. I mean, I see a quote often, I forget exactly what it is, but I see a quote often that says, you know, you, the, the last thing you want is your, for your vocal employees to go silent. And I find that nine times out of 10, that is because an expectation of theirs was broken. You know, that they, sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry. I said, what's interesting is that's one of the top ones on the candidate experience. And, and, and it's fascinating, and it also proves the value and importance of a candidate experience, because what the candidate experience is doing is setting expectations for the employee experience. Was the person courteous, kind? Were, were people friendly if I got went into the office or if I had an interview? When... I was, when I had a coughing attack, did they offer me water or did they seem annoyed that I was delaying them? Whatever it might be, these are foundational to the expectations of what it means to be an employee there. And anytime there is a disconnect between that, that's a bre breaking in expectations. That's where the frustration is, where, you know, Jason mentioned employer branding. Well, unfortunately, a lot of companies are great at talking a good game at employer branding. They can even do a good job at candidate experience. And then when people come on board, they find out it's nothing like what they thought it was. Good and so guys. that would, <laughs> expectations, I would say, is certainly number one. Beyond that, I mean, it comes down to the individuals and there's certain things that are, I mean, like I said before, there's certain things that should just be table stakes around psychological safety, around clarity, all of these things. I mean, we talk about generational differences and I do believe the differences between generations is not in our psychology. We all have certain base needs. We want to love and be loved. We want clarity. We want work, all of these things but it's around our expectations and that's what has really changed over time which is now changing again bringing it back circle the demand conditions and our expectations of what and how employers need to act toward us to keep on keeping us around good news for the three of us 
in trying to help solve this is I just read the statistic by 2050, there will be eight generations working together in the workplace. Right now we're struggling with five. We used to struggle with four because because people will be working. The youngest population now is expected to live to be 150 years old. So people working in their 90s and 100 years old will be a norm in 20 to 30 years out. So which is why companies. <laughs> sorry, but this is also but this is which is why companies that serve those human needs across generations. Like I said, there's some things regardless of what generation you, we are, if you're able to meet that and then have the nuance to meet people where they are from there, that will put you at a competitive advantage of actually keeping all eight generations around. Well, this conversation is going going to continue, but not today. Uh, we're almost out of time. We're going to be kicked off the air very shortly. Gil, it's been an absolute p- pleasure. This is an emerging, evolving story, and we can't wait to catch up with you again at some point. In the meantime, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you, learn a little bit more about what you do? So the best two ways are to either find me on LinkedIn, Gil Cohen. You'll find me, employee experience, my shining face there. Or email me at gil, G-I-L, at employeeexperience.ca. Those are the two best ways. Right, not .com, .ca. But. .ca. That's uh, that's uh, the Canadians. I appreciate very much, Gil. It's, a, it's great to meet you. We just met earlier. We're gonna. You and I will continue the conversation. I'm sure the three of us will continue that in the near future. And uh, love to have you back. But thanks for for sharing everything today. It's, it was a great conversation. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gil. Stay safe. Thank you, Jason. An, another great introduction. A good person in my in, in in my world, in my sphere. Fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, you can tell and our listeners can't too. I mean, Gil knows his stuff. He's done this stuff with companies. And I think one of the things I appreciated that I've learned about him over the year and a half that, that I've known him is he shared one of those today. Number one is if you're a business leader, this doesn't have to cost you extra money. Like you don't need to be scared. You don't need to throw the objection. We don't have budget for that. You got to remove that objection off the table. This doesn't cost extra money to do experience well. And the second objection we didn't get into today, though, is, well, this is going to be too complex. No, people are really simple. They've told us the same things over 30 years employees have in terms of what the core drivers are for what they want from work. Autonomy, flexibility, feedback loops. They want opportunities to grow and develop, and they want to be shown appreciation. You just focus on those five things and you do those consistently well. You are really going to elevate your company, keep your people. They're going to be healthier and and it'll contribute to their wellness. So don't make it too complex. Yeah, for sure. Again, we want to thank everybody for being a member of Googleization Nation, for listening to Geek Skeezers and Googleization. We are going to continue similar conversation next week with our guest, uh, Keith Campagna. You might remember Keith. Keith used to be my co-host on the show for almost two years. Uh, He's going to welcome back. Uh, He's been working with the ROI shop and uh, his passion, which is life work integration. Uh, So we're going to learn a little bit what he's doing and certainly fits into uh, our conversations uh, about employee experience and whether you want to call it the great resignation, the great reset, or a great reprioritization, whatever it might be, please join us. And uh, as we always close each week, don't let the shift hit your plans.